Part six of uh, the Revelation series. Last week I had announced a title, but I had to change it because we did not get that far. So last week I said that our title would be uh, Revelation, uh, a call to uh, revival, but we didn't get to the revival yet. So this week we are going in that direction. Last week we were supposed to talk about three churches, but finally we only talked about the church in Smyrna, the one that the Lord Jesus said, you are rich. Amen? So if we go, just a way of review quickly, uh, on the Lord's Day, John was on Patmos, he got a vision from the Lord, and the, the vision, the, the, the loud voice told him, to what you see, what you receive, write it to the seven churches. So we, saw, we began looking last week how the Lord uh, looked at the church and evaluates the, 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 the church. And we need to rethink our approach to the church and how we select a church, how we uh, decide for our church, and how we evaluate and judge different church. We also looked at the position of the Lord and the description of the Lord that we saw it in the, the other slides there and we saw that all everything was relevant the the robe the golden sash the the hair the eyes the descriptions because the Lord is uh, portraying his own glory because we have seen in the gospel the Lord coming as a baby as and his humility and his humility as a man but now Jesus Christ returned to his position and glory. And before this extremely uh, outstanding and amazing judgment comes, when God will deal with the sinfulness of this world, before that he wants to reveal to his church in the last days who he really is and his amazing uh, descriptions, the portrait of his glory and of his amazing uh, uh, might and power. We, we need to rediscover what the Lord Jesus is because we have been men very much um, influenced by the picture of his frailty as a human being, by the uh, picture of his humility on the cross, of uh, accepting to be condemned and, uh, and unfairly beaten. And, uh, but Jesus, when he comes back, is not going to accept that anymore. He's going to come as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And he gives us uh, pictures of his majesty, of his absolute uh, glory and might. Then after that, we also s began looking last week at the next slide, how the Lord when he addressed each individual churches, uh, introduced himself uh, in a unique way to each churches. And we, we began talking about it last week, that for each church, according to their social environment, to their spiritual conditions, then the Lord Jesus will address to them a unique, special message relevant to them, applicable to them, but at the same time, he reveals a, a, a form of his character, a uniqueness of his nature that will match the situation that the church is in. The need to, to receive that aspect of the glory of Jesus Christ to understand the message. So we looked also at the church of Smyrna last week, and we can have this, this slide also. Uh, the church in Smyrna, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I knew your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. To a church that was physically poor, heavily persecuted, a church that was in the uh, uh, potential death and suffering and persecutions every day, the Lord says, you are rich. So the Lord doesn't look at the church as we look at the church. Last week, I said, we go to, uh, face, uh, to, to uh, online on Google, we type churches here, churches there, and we decide to embrace this church because we like the pictures, because we like the something, some aspects of what we, we see externally. But the Lord Jesus looks internally to each of the churches. So they, they live always in persecution. And the Lord, if you notice to the church in Smyrna, he, uh, that explains why the Lord emphasized um, his death and his resurrections. I am the first and the last, the one who was dead and came back to life. Because he's addressing a church that was living daily 
and the danger of, of death. And then that it talks a lot about the crown of life and that they will not have to experience the second death because, you know, so everything has to about eternity, life, persevere, don't be afraid of death and all this. And Jesus revealing himself and his eternity, the first and the last and all of this. So we talked about it. To that church, there was not a single word of accusation. If we want to go to the, the chart quickly, uh, I just uh, summarize a, a chart of the message of Jesus to the seven churches. The loveless church, the suffering church is the one we're talking about, the worldly church, the wrong doctrine, the spiritually dead church, the spiritually alive church, and the complacent uh, church. And if you look at the failures uh, toward a Smyrna, none. No accusation, nothing, no words like uh, what I have against you. There, there is nothing. So uh, I will give you the crown of life and everything. So it, it's, it's a way to look. For most of them, they have something negative. And the message, repent, 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 strengthen, uh, repent. It's, it's a lot about repent. You go back, think about what you're uh, missing out. And then a promise to the faithful, a promise that if, if you conquer that weakness, if you change this aspect that I have against you, if you come back to me, then this is what I'm going, I'm going to do. So now we, we want to, to go to the next church, which will be uh, Laodicea, the, the church uh, we call the foolish church, or the complacent, or the lukewarm church, and we want to continue in this way. To Smyrna, the Lord showed, his, he, he identified by the title, I am the one who died and the one who live. So now to Laodicea, he will identify with this church in a different, and presenting himself in a different way. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. How many would like to be spit out of the Lord's mouth? I wouldn't want that at all. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are rich, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. What a contrast to last week when that church was poor, nothing, a little thing somewhere. Uh, nobody would want to choose the church in Smyrna and identify with their sufferings and being despised by society and all the put down and everything. But the Lord says, you are rich. And here you have the other mega church, the successful church, a church made of successful people, uh, good status in society, and a lot of activities and good things is going on there. A lot of projects, a lot of social work and everything. And the Lord says, whoa, wait a minute. You think, you, s you say you are rich. You, your, your mind is set. But me, I see something else. And this is why the Lord presented himself as the Amen and the, the true witness and the faithful witness. You know this amen that we're talking about is the amen that created the world. The word, the word of God and so be it. Like the, 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 the true uh, eternal creator, the maker of this world, the, the amen. When he says something, it happens. When there is a prophecy of scriptures, when you read in the book of Isaiah, I told you these things in advance so that you know I am the Lord, I am your redeemer. You can trust me because my word is faithful. The Old Testament, the New Testament shows and attests to the truthfulness and the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. So he identifies to this church. Because, you know, Jesus is the Logos. He is the Amen. Nothing of what has been created has been created without His Word. He is the Creator, the, the Logos, the, the Logos Creator and everything. So that means, there is a consequence to that. This whole world belongs to Him. He is the ruler of this whole world. 
And everything that we need of this world for our lives is going to be provided by God. If you are going to live in plenty, the Lord is blessing you with plenty. The Lord will provide to all of your needs. We have access to prayer. The Lord says every day when you pray, ask for your daily bread. He says, do not worry for what you will wear, everything. Your Heavenly Father knows you need these things. He will provide to all of these things. So the, 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 the Old Testament and the New Testament show us the faithfulness of God that we should not fear about our lives. That God is on our side. And God has the, the, he owns everything. All the cattle on the thousand hills. All the gold and all the silver is his. Is, and all the blessing comes from him. But here is a church that disconnected and that forgot this the amen the creator aspect of God amen, amen. so there is a lukewarm uh, church here the Lord is going to give his own um, uh, diagnosis of this church the lukewarm Christian church here is comfortable it's complacent and does not realize its own need you know lukewarm it's not really cold and it's not really hot. It's in the between. Eh? Okay? Lukewarm. They were enough lukewarm so to make people believe that they were a church of God. So there's enough activities and look and appearance that it appears to be a church of God. But it is also lukewarm about the divine things of God or the things of God. They are lukewarm. They don't really are hot about the things of God. They are not really interested about the things of God enough that the, that makes the Lord to have a nausea about them. So lukewarm is not really, really good because in, in, the, uh, in our eyes, lukewarm may appear may appear as, as okay, as, as there is life there. It's something okay, it's normal, it, they, they're just like uh, medium, okay? But to the Lord, lukewarm is not to his, his standards. The character of the church is pride, they are self-sufficient, they are complacent and ignorance. And that reminded me, this text in Deuteronomy chapter 8, I mean, I look at the church, just like I explained last week with the church of Smyrna and this church, and you see a repetition, a continuity of the Old Testament. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 8, when you get into this beautiful land and you build houses and your crops give plenty and everything, be careful, be warned where it comes. Let me, let me read that to you because it's, uh, it's really good. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse then uh, uh, it's not on the transparency, so just listen for me just a moment. When you have eaten and are satisfied, bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given to you. Be careful, otherwise you will forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commands, blah, blah, and all this. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you have built beautiful houses and live in them, when your cattle and all of this and uh, your gold increase, then you will become arrogant, you will neglect the Lord your God who brought you out and all of this. And then verse 18 says, But remember the Lord, uh, your God, because He is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth in order to confirm His covenant. He is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So remember the Lord. And this church here are doing exactly the opposite. It's a repetition or a continuity of what we read in the Old Testament. They did not remember that the Amen, the creator of this world, is the one that they depend because they became so self-productive uh, and they forgot uh, about the Lord. Someone said, there is nothing more disgusting than a half-hearted nominal Christian who is self-sufficient. It's not really giving a nice picture of the Lord Jesus. It's never going to be attractive to the unsaved people. You know, there's so many accusations against the church of Jesus Christ in this world, and it has to do with some aspect like this. It's not appealing. It's not attractive. It's not a good representation of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his heart. Yeah, and here this, these people, people here were like this. This church in Smyrna thought of himself as being poor 
and they receive the praise of the Lord because he says, you are yet, you are rich. And the Laodiceans, they boasted that they were rich, but in fact, they were poor. How can the church become so disconnected from the reality of God's things, of God's verdict? and God analysis. How can we be so blind that we do not know about our own spiritual uh, reality? Look at the Old Testament. It's, 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 it was like this. Look at the New Testament. It's the same thing. Why? Because it is a characteristic of our human nature. If we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, and refreshed and connected with the living Holy Spirit inside of us. We are just flesh. We are just human. And it is just our carnal nature that will dominate us. And we will disconnect from the spiritual reality and just use the values of this world to evaluate and compare and to make, make choices. So there's nothing new about it. So this church declined spiritually because they became very proud and they can't begin to measure things according to human uh, standards. They were, in the eyes of the Lord, wretched and miserable and poor in contrast with the other church we talked about uh, last week. Laodicea was a very wealthy city, a banking center, a textile center, uh, city. Uh, they had discovered and promoted dyeing clothes, uh, the, the garments. And they had also, amazingly, uh, discovered and promoted this uh, medicine for the eyes, the, uh, the uh, ointment for the blind people and the people who had problems. So the Lord addressed these three things when He talks to them. He says, buy from me gold instead of the worldly material success that they were enjoying. And he says, uh, buy clothes of righteousness from me, my clothes, fine linen, that are the works of righteousness from me, instead of the, the textile of the city and the beautiful garments that they would enjoy showing off. You know, you go to church on Sundays and people want to show their beautiful uh, new, uh, you know, whatever. Remember, I, I told you one time I went to, I was invited to go to a church in New York, Long Island, New York, uh, as a missionary guest. Uh, that. And we were told that it was a camp meeting and uh, we arrived there and I was going to preach to another church in New York and the Bronx which is like uh, the Bronx like the tough place where people are get killed if you go to just uh, and you enter a store you never know if you will get come out alive in that place so a, a very dangerous place so for that weekend we did not carry any suits or ties or anything so we just went to preach to a church from the Bronx from the you know uh, grassroots people and we were going to a camp meeting so the camp meeting to us like we're going camping but no, it was not like this. This was a rich church. And the ladies were wearing gold and silver, like everywhere in their hair. And their, even gold with their shoes and everything. And the big limousine would come. And the men had big rings, bigger than my hands, and all of this. And they were all giant people. And we came there without a tie. We were in jeans. And we were the guests sitting in the front room, in the front of the church. He says, we're sorry, we're sorry. We thought we were going camping. He says, no, no. So we learned that the uh, camp meeting in the U.S. is not camping. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the city there the, in, in Laodicea, they, they were really a, a rich and successful church. They had like people and perhaps some of the spirit of the marketplace crept into the church. You know, when you have rich people in the church, they want to dominate. They have the know-how. They, they know how to do business. And, and it is true. In some ways, they do know a lot of things and we have to learn. But in the Lord's eyes, there is a spiritual approach and a need of the Lord and prayer and humility and attitudes and all of this. So we need always to, to connect with the Lord and His Holy Spirit. You know, imagine, uh, even in the previous century, someone wrote, why is it that so many church bulletins and letterheads show pictures of buildings? Why is it so important to show our buildings? 
like the, the, the successful of our, you know, constructions and everything. Are these the things that are most important to us? Uh, or the board of the Laodicean Church could proudly show the latest annual report with its impressive statistics. We have so much money in the bank and we, you know, we have so much success. Yet Jesus says he was about to vomit them of their church, of, of his mouth. So this is something we need to, to step back and reconsider a lot of our approach about the church. The point is, are you growing spiritually? Are you stronger in the church? Does the church help you to connect with Jesus Christ? Does it help your spiritual life? Are you more connected with the Lord now than you were uh, years ago or months ago or weeks ago? The Laodiceans were blind. They could not see their reality. They were fooling themselves because they were just about being rejected. You know, that, that's it's a serious thought. The church exists, the church meets, the church has a picture of success, and yet they are just about to be vomited from the Lord's mouth. That's a tragedy, I would say. Do you agree? Yes. It, is, it is a very sad uh, reality. Peter teaches in 2 Peter chapter 1, when a believer is not adding, you know, virtue and knowledge and faith and love and all of this, when you are not growing in the Lord, you come to a point of forgetting where you're coming from, where grace is, what's the source of your life. You forget these things and you became blind again. I have this text right here, just a moment, I will read it to you. For whoever lacks these qualities, whoever is not adding these qualities that I just mentioned, is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. And there is a possibility of a good start in the Lord and then of regressing instead of growing, of hardening instead of having a softened uh, heart and to, the, and to the Lord. And that is the tragedy of that church. Let's go to verse 18 to 22, the next slide. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. That's what I was talking about. The city was famous for its wealth, for its clothing industry, dying of the clothes and the eye ointment. So the Lord chose these three pr uh, uh, reasons of pride, you know, of that church. And he says, whoa, come back, come back down. There's something more than the external uh, world that you, you, you are forgetting. To those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the doors, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. The one who concurs, I will grant him to sit with me on the throne. And I also concurred and sat down with my father on his throne. He was in here. Let him hear. The Laodiceans could go to the market and purchase fine and stylish clothes, but they needed something more important the fine linen of the righteousness uh, of God. And in this church, there is no commendation. You know the church of uh, Smyrna? There was no words of rebuke. To that church, there is no words of praise or appreciation, not a single word uh, thing. But they were a successful church. Uh, and and I don't want to, to point fingers to any style of churches because we, we cannot, we cannot. You may have a mega church that is really probably in the Lord and living in the Spirit. You may have another one that might be the Laodiceans. You may have a smaller kind of church that is also a Laodicean church. So it's not about all being big or all being small. It's an attitude. It's, it's a way that we live our church life. It's our goals. It's the purpose. Why do we exist? What, what is our personality? What is our relation? What is the, the purpose of why we exist? Why does Lighthouse exist? Are our works satisfying to the Lord? Our missions, you heard about the ATAS, you hear us about uh, different things. You know, I have learned my life to appreciate challenges. 
And I have said it many times because I, I have been called to be a missionary. That's why I'm a pastor in Lighthouse. But I, I am a missionary. So it means that I go out also of the walls of the church sometimes and I go to preach uh, in the Philippines or in China. I've been to India, Sri Lanka uh, in 2006 and all this. So I have this privilege. But I often said to the church, you know, if it is to your benefit to allow your pastor to go on a mission journey, why? Because when we go, we get refreshed. We get challenged. We see something that, that is uh, producing life transformation. Sometimes we are shocked. Sometimes we are challenged. Sometimes we are encouraged. Sometimes we are facing things that are too big. But personally, I have learned through the years to, that challenges are good for me spiritually. And if it is good for me, then it is good for the church. You know, I remember years ago when I used to be going to China to preach, and my Chinese has always been too, you know, when to, to preach is a big responsibility. And my Chinese was not up to that. I remember like going on a train journey, sometimes 20 hours, 30 hours by train to reach my journey, and then buses and whatever. Lord, help me. Lord help me, my Chinese is not up, I cannot do this. I remember every time I would come from one particular uh, uh, journey that I would do regularly. I would go to Wuhan, then I would go to Henan province, then I'd preach in the countryside and come back. And on the way back from Wuhan I would stop in Changsha. I would arrive there in Changsha at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then they would pick me up, the, 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 the church, at, at the uh, son that has a taxi. They would bring me to their home. They would feed me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Then I would sleep. And then in the morning, the house was full of people waiting for me to preach. And then I just come out of the room, my hair like this and all this, and I'm walking in front of all of them. And they spoke a dialect there that I could not understand. <laughs> And I had no translator when I was going there. I was going just by faith. But the whole trip from Wuhan, six hours by train to Changsha, says, Lord, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. I can't do that. Then I would go to wash my face and comb my hair, brush my teeth, and come back. Okay, now teach us the Word of God. And we had these wonderful meetings where all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we had so many good experiences there. But it was beyond my ability. It was God coming through. But I know how I felt to go there. But then when I would come out of there, I was so like a, um, like a brain, uh, no, no more brain, like no more energy. Uh, like I was like burn out. Like my brain was burned out as so I was going back home. Same thing with the medical mission. When we started this medical mission, maybe it looks easy, like, oh, we're having a medical mission, we're having a medical mission. But you have to realize where it's coming from. This medical mission is coming from a, a, a desire that God has put in our hearts to people who have no medical experience. People who never done it before. People who doesn't know where to start and what to do and what is required and everything. So it's like a mountain of challenges coming before us. But the Lord has shown us that the resources will come. You know, we didn't have money. We didn't have anything. We didn't have doctors. I had one dentist friend. That's all we had when we started. Nothing more. He says, oh, but we should do it. For if, he says, okay, even if we don't, no medicine, no doctors, we will evangelize. At least we can do that. And then God would, uh, would add something. And something came from crossroads like some goods for the children and all of these clothes. And then a company in Canada offered free medicine. And then someone in the Philippines suggested that we should hire doctors in the Philippines because, you know, they are there on site and everything. And step by step, things would come and people came. And some friends gathered some money. They visited churches in Canada, got some money. And then with a little budget, then we started our first medical mission. But what I'm saying is that challenges, things that we don't know how to do, things we have never done before, uh, to change something. That's why going to two services is, is one of the greatest things that uh, can happen to Lighthouse. Because if we are so comfortable, you know, on our chair, some of you, maybe you, you think that the chairs you're sitting on every Sunday morning, it belongs to you. This is your chair and nobody is allowed to sit on that chair. I've always sat on that chair. 
Some of you think that the fourth floor belongs to you and the microwave is yours to use first and nobody else will warm their, their food before my food is being done. And, and you know, having a second service is going to disturb things that we have done in a certain way. But it's going to be a good disturb. It's going to be a spiritual disturbance. It's going to allow more people to join us and everything. And think about it. If you are involved in Sunday school and everything, you're missing out on the service. You can come to the first service, do the children's on the second service. You have no reason to miss service. There are so many positive points about it. But there's also going to be some negative, OK? But these negatives are going to be good, good negative, amen? Good challenges, and we will face them, we will adapt to these things, and we will make it work by God's grace and God's power, amen? amen. And the church will grow, you will grow, and we will be in the will of the Lord. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Oh, God is so good. Yes, I want to jump higher. <laughs> yes, praise God, hallelujah. And the Lord closed this letter with three special statements. An explanation. He tells us why he rebukes and why he's disciplined. You know, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Amen. This is not a punishing God. This is not an angry God. This is a God who loves us enough not to let us go on in this way so that we can come back and we can enjoy eternity with him because that's the point. This church was fooling themselves. They are playing church. They are doing the, the, maybe their music is good music and they do a lot of things, but they are not going to go to heaven. But they are called a church. For those of you who are older Christian, maybe you would remember in the 80s there was this series of movies they were so good it's the end times movies uh, a thief and the night and all of these movies uh, distant thunder yes all of this and wow these movies were like scaring us to not to go to heaven and showing us what possibly could happen in this world and that time and 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 it was just there to to stir us up and make sure that we were in a good standing with, with the Lord and all of this. The Lord wants us to go to heaven. But in this series of movie, you would have seen in the, the first of the series, the church and the Christian people, some of them did not go up into the rapture. The pastor of the church did not go up in the rapture. When, when we were young Christians, we looked at these movies, and then there was persecutions, not only persecution, but they were martyred, and in the movie, the Christians had their heads cut off, like the French guillotine, you know, something like that. And that was how the, in the movie they would, they would show us. And the tribulations, Christians would be ran after by the government, superpower police, and all of this. They would be brought to prison, asked to deny their, 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 their life, and they would be called like the haters and the troublemakers. And then if they would not deny their, their, their faith, their heads were being cut off. And I remember my wife and I, when we were young Christian, we were watching these movies. If that would happen to us, what we would be do, doing? <laughs> Uh, we want to make it, we want to go to with Jesus for eternity, you know? Because it, these were presented to us as possibilities. But, you know, when you saw that the, the pastor of the church did not go up, and many of the followers of this pastor did not go up. But then after the rapture, then they all became Christian. Because now they knew that the prophetic word had been fulfilled and now they were trying to redeem themselves but they had to redeem themselves just like the book of Revelation says through their own blood, through martyr, through being pursued by the police and put in prison and killed. The book of Revelation is written for us. And Jesus explained his motives here, as many as I love. I rebuke and chasten because he wants you and me to make it to go to heaven. And any 
worldly and carnal attitudes and complacencies and uh, we, we are not growing anymore needs to be stirred up. It needs to be broken. This pattern of laziness and complacency or so whatever it is that has stopped us to continue to love Jesus and run toward Jesus and depend upon Jesus and live the life to its fullest. Whatever is stopping us needs to be addressed. Amen? Amen. And that's what the Lord says. He still loved these lukewarm saints. They are lukewarm. He's just about to vomit them. But he loves them enough to rebuke them so that he doesn't have to vomit them. But accepting, accepting him. That he loves them. Even though their love had grown cold. So we see the intention of the Lord. This is a picture of mercy. The mercy of the Lord is amazing. The word mercy is one of the most beautiful words in the old dictionary. If you understand what it means. God does everything to save us. Even if we do not deserve it. He will do. He will seek after you. He will give you chance over chance. He will send his prophets. His message. He will do all sorts of things to chast and get your attention. So that you will make it to heaven. So if we don't make it to heaven. None of us. No human being will ever be able to point a finger of accusation. You know this generation like blind people and foolish people. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of fingers pointing to God and eh, this society but on the day when we will be face to face before the Lord there will not be a single finger pointing toward the gods in accusation blah, blah, blah. there will not be you know how what position the people will be they will be on their knees confessing that you are Lord I was wrong you were right and Lord I apologize and, and then after that there will be tears and gnashing of teeth for eternity and regret for eternity and darkness for eternity and all this. So because of that, Jesus knows. He knows behind the scene. He knows the, the reality of eternity. So he is warning us because he loves us. And even though we are lukewarm, even though we're just about to, to, to having no life inside of us, he is still loving us enough to warn us and chastise us and bring us back. He planned to chasten us as a proof of his love. The second word is a word of exhortation. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The word zealous is a very interesting word. It's like be passionate, be focused on the most important thing. Uh, earnest, like it's like a fire inside. Like it, the, uh, the all the, this is the complete opposite of their attitudes. They are complacent. There is no fire. There is nothing that interests them. They are bored. They are like, like the children of our generation. Children of our generation, they are only, they seem alive only when they are like on their smartphone, isn't it? Remove their smartphone. It's so boring, nothing to do. Nothing. Like the, the Christian of our generation, we are like this also, always bored about, you know, even Christian life is boring. Everything is boring. You know, that this, this is. So Jesus says, be zealous therefore. Like, like focus on the most important. Come back. P put your heart into it. Like, where's the fire for me? And restore that and come back to me. And finally, there is the famous invitation that we all know we can quote it. Behold, I knock at the door. If you hear, you open the door. I will come in and I will eat with you. Amen? And we use it in evangelism, but it's not evangelism at all. This word is nothing to do with evangelism, even though it can be applied. But his, his ultimate uh, interpretation is to the church, is to you and to me. And this is why the church is so uh, blind. They don't know the Lord is not within them. They, they don't know that His presence is not there. He is not participating into their activities. He does not tolerate their activities. He doesn't like what they are doing. What they call church, it is not a representation of His church. He is not proud of that. He is not with them anymore. They don't care about Him. They are independent of Him. They are self-sufficient. They are not crying out to the Lord. There is no more prayer meeting in that church. Because prayer means depending on the Lord. In that church, there is no more prayer meeting. There is no fasting. There is no crying out to the Lord. There is no tears. Maybe there is like appearance of joy, 
dancing, whatever it is we can do. Like sometimes I watch on, on YouTube uh, these huge Christian concerts and I listen to the words of some of the songs and I wonder what's really going on in the spiritual world? I mean I can see like 40,000 young people that are jumping <laughs> you know the rock star is going in the front and all of this and it's beautiful and it looks so lively and, of this, and then says everywhere you will send me I will go I will go I will go <laughs> okay then after the concert where are you going? <laughs> uh, okay maybe you jump not so high in the concert room but then you go uh, do something for the Lord Lord we will tell you we will declare we will be bold we will be strong but then they, they, they go back to school and they don't even live as Christian I don't know I'm not judging I'm just asking myself a question like does that mean something when an old auditorium of thousands of people are gathering together and it's supposed to be church is that really church I don't know I'm not God I cannot say. But here I am with Pastor Jennifer. We are pastors. We talk together. We pray for the church. We are concerns. We have plans. We have ideas or something. We care for the people that are connected with us in the Philippines, everywhere in China. We want to see the glory of God. We want to be connected. We don't want to regret. We don't want to be ashamed. We want to do whatever is right. And here the invitation. Now, see, without my jumping, I'm, uh, I'm out of breath, you know, now. <laughs> the Lord says, <laughs> this is a personal invitation to all of us. This word is a personal invitation. This is not like just like a general word to, to the, a group. This is a personal. If anyone hears my voice, then you decide what you want to do if you want to open it, the door of your heart. The door of our heart is something that is very, very precious. It's very personal. It's very intimate. That's my heart. And I'm not going to give my heart to any so-called prophet. It's too precious. If I'm going to give my heart to someone, I want to give it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Nobody else. And I need to protect this heart. I need to keep it alive. And I need to decide that I'm going to open the heart and let the Lord come and eat with me and me with Him. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's stand together. Hallelujah. <laughs>